Hello, welcome back to my channel. I'm joined today by some lovely guests here to discuss Ruin, the third book in the Faithful and the Fallen series by John Gwynn. Um, I don't know if anyone, you probably know who these people are, but if they want to just introduce themselves again and say hello. Hi, I'm Patrick. <laughs> I'm, I'm Alan from the Library of Alan. And I'm Alex in front of a window because I have nowhere else to go at the moment. <laughs> Alex has moved into his new place, which we're excited to see, uh, but uh, we'll let him get settled first. But I'm Philip Chase, and it's so lovely to be here on your channel, Abby. Thank you so much for hosting us. Yes, thank you, Abby. Not a problem at all. So I guess we'll start with, we'll have spoilers for Malice and uh <laughs> but we can start with some non-spoilery thoughts of Ruin before we dive into Ruin spoilers. So I don't know if we want to do round robin if Patrick wants to start. Uh, what's the question? <laughs> what should we start so, with? Like non-spoilery uh, thoughts. Ah, okay. Uh, I think I'll start with the pacing, okay. Oh, Alan just went away. <laughs> 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 Should we wait for him? He's abandoned us. No, he'll come yeah. back. He'll be he's back. He's ruined. <laughs> what, what is he doing? What are you I doing? I wrote thoughts down. I'm sitting there like, what were my thoughts on ruin? I'm like, I wrote them down. <laughs> <laughs> were you banished from us? <laughs> my, my notebook's in the garage. Yeah. Uh, okay, I guess uh, I'll start with uh, thoughts on the pacing. I would say that uh, for Ruin, I think the pacing is more like a mix between Malice and Valor. Uh, in Valor, it was all actions, almost all nonstop actions, with only uh, a few moments of respite. But in Ruin, I think uh, it's more of a balance between Malice and and Valor. Yeah, and there is a lot, a lot of revelations in this one. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, for real. <laughs> now, that's, that's actually one of the reasons why, for me, Ruin is so far. I have not read Wrath yet, so Alan and I are the two uh, who cannot be spoiled for Wrath. But for me, Ruin is the best book in the series so far. And yeah. Patrick put his finger on one of the reasons why I believe that the variation is mm. is a great thing and there were moments in here that were i found incredibly moving uh there were some great speeches uh so there was some great uh comedic moments uh, with like uh, dath and feral and so just you know I, I i like that variation i think that's that's a a helpful thing and in other senses i do think ruin is really a step up as much as i really loved the first mm. two books yeah. ruin is um in terms of the prose I found myself just stopping to admire sentences more mm -hmm. often in Ruin than in the previous two books uh, in terms of, as Patrick said, the pacing, the <laughs> character development, and, yeah. and just so many. And in terms of what Gwyn does with tropes, I thought yeah. that, okay, so the first two books, you think this is pretty tropey, but it's done well. Basically, yep. he's, he's taken the tropes and he's, he's doing a really good job of handling them. In Ruin, he surprised me. He did some yeah. things that I did not expect. Yep. And I really respect that. Uh, I love it when an author surprises me. So <clears throat> absolutely hats off to Gwyn. Uh, Ruin is uh, a, a really a marvelous book. And I, I just feel like he just stepped it up here as yeah. an author and for the series as a whole. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I agree with all that. Um, I, I wept twice. And not, <laughs> not, not, a, not at one of the parts you think. But I wept twice, and you don't understand. I also, I audible. Ava, shut up. Nobody wants your opinion. <laughs> I also literally was like, yes, yes, at one part, just like screaming because it was a moment that I had been waiting for for two books. And two, I know, I know what you, I know what you're talking about. I was finally like, yes, but I and I also really like. Um, first of all, the uh, the female characters in this book, like the women, had to have had to rise up to the occasion mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. book. And I really like that after two books of running, this is the book where people finally start saying no. 
we're mm. done running. We're going yep. to make a stand. We're going to try to, instead of play this defensively, we're going to take the fight to them, finally. And so there is still some running. I mean, you got you to have to. But I did like that. I feel like the characters took back a lot of their agency in this book um, to where, you know, they're not just... Uh, going with uh, with the ebb and flow of 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 the, the 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 enemies, like they are trying to actually take charge of the situation. So I really really like that as well. Yeah, definitely. And to to Philip's point about the writing and the prose, you can see John Gwynn's evolution as an author through these books, and they do honestly get better and better. And I do think Wrath is the best book. So every mm -hmm. single book, I was like, wow, this is my new favorite. And then you read Ruin, and I was like, this is my new favorite. Um, and then you read that, and then exactly. this is my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So the, the writing is definitely a step up. Uh, the, the pacing was probably the best because of that blend of action packed, which I love, which is why I love uh, Valor so much, with the actual That's moments in between. Whereas Valor, I think we mentioned last time, you get like a glimpse of like a breath, and then it's back to the action. This really does take its time in certain areas. Um, it's by far, I think, the best character work of the series up to this point, nice. for sure. And as some of the most epic uh, battles that we've seen, absolutely. Uh, I'm eager to see Alan's reaction to the two times that he cried, because yeah. the main one that got, I, I think I know one of them, and the main one that got me is the one that we're all thinking of, but I'm interested to see what this other one is. But yeah, this series, man, it's the, I, I'd say to Philip's point about the tropes, that's probably the best thing that this book does is it really makes you go, oh, like that's what's happening. So yeah, the, the it, it was, and it was great. Like, oh, this is not what I was expecting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, how is this happening? How, how is, what? Because like, he completely flips the tropes on their head, which is yeah. so well done. And you're like, you think you know these tropes because you've seen them before. And suddenly you're like, oh, oh, you've done that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the pacing, you're absolutely right, that it really does have an excellent blend of the action and the character development. And they're like, the, there are a few like slower, more emotional scenes, which mm. I think blended really well with the action. Yeah. Oh. Like uh, the one, two for vengeance, one for love. Oh. <laughs> that one was, oh. <laughs> what a moment that was. <laughs> yeah. Definitely some of the most memorable scenes in the series so far are from Ruin. Uh, yeah, the one yeah. you just alluded to, Patrick, was powerful. Well, that and, one was powerful. I almost cried yeah. at that scene. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, is that in a third book of a series, it gets harder and harder to talk non-spoiler. Yeah, uh, yeah. it is. Because, you know, like everything, like everything is literally built on on the the foundations of the first two. And I'm just like, I'm just itching, like. <laughs> Shall we scratch that itch then, Alan, and move on to I mean, does anyone, have anything unless anyone has any other non spoilery thoughts? I mean, yet again, it ends on a cliffhanger where we're just like, really? Like, really? Oh, the cliffhanger really? is brutal. <laughs> yeah. It is. I, yeah. I last non spoiler. Add, Go ahead. Yeah, just sorry, Alex. Uh, I oh, just wanted fine. to add for anyone who's watched so far and, and hasn't read the books. Um, I, I think you're gonna, if, I've been basically in uh, telling people that uh, aren't really fantasy readers to check out this series. I think it's a wonderful introduction to fantasy. I For love, sure. uh, I yeah, I, I just think when you're thinking about, cause sometimes I'm sure all of you have seen this question on your channel before or uh, some variation of it, which is okay, I, I'm interested in reading some fantasy what do you recommend? I don't want anything too YA. I want something that's a little more uh, adult. And um, I just, I'm not that familiar with the genre yet though. I just think that The Faithful and the Fallen is a fantastic introduction to the genre in so many ways because of what we mentioned about him handling the tropes really well, but also now doing something really different with them. And because of the, the way he handles the characters, which, uh, you know, it's a very readable, series mm -hmm. so I, I, think, I think it's a great recommendation for people who are absolutely to get their get, get their toes wet and, and get a little familiar with the genre i think the only thing someone might struggle with as a new fantasy reader is the lack of a dramatis personae in malice yeah 
Yeah, yeah like that's, I was about to say really that. Yeah. You do other. get it in Valor, though. Yeah, which in is the nice. other books we have them. It's much, much yeah, better. I mean, but there's just so many. It's a much more digestible version of an epic fantasy. It's not bloated or heavy in description. You're not going to fall off with something potentially like a Malazan or Wheel of Time where it's just so many pages and so much text. It's so much, much more digestible and kind of like a good <laughs> blend between like Wheel of Time and like a Brandon Sanderson book where it's super easy to read. Um, it's not complicated sentences or really flowery prose or anything like that. And while there are a lot of characters, you can remember most of them, I feel like. Even the tertiary characters are a little bit more uh, prevalent as opposed to Wheel of Time where it's like, I don't remember who this 400th Aes Sedai is. Like, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of characters, but it's digestible. And, and just if you like action, I mean, oh, yeah. these books are perfect. There are so many B names, so many B names, and they all have they all have, they all have dark hair. Like they all have dark hair, except for they like all have dark hair and beards. Alan, they, all, they do. They all have dark hair, and there's like one, <laughs> like Coraline's redheaded, and uh, Corbin's Castell. Castell is red. Castell. Castell. Castell is redhead. Redhead. Yeah, he's, Castell is red. 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 Idana is blonde, I think. Yeah. yeah. I will say from are, reading Shadow of the Gods, though, he gives you more description on characters. So. Yeah, yeah. Shadow of the Gods, it's much more descriptive than The Faithful and the Fallen. Me and Abby are reading that in May. Yeah. Nice. It's good. And if you want female characters, there you go. We, we're doing yeah, that met, for, for, for shelf space. You met Orca, huh? <laughs> right. Orca's the best, man. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, I, ju I, just wanted to, I just want to add to what Alan said. Uh, regarding this as an introduction to new fantasy reader, I think uh, what Philip said is also true. But uh, I have heard several times for a lot from quite a lot of readers that the first half of Malice, if they're still new to epic fantasy, is kind of hard to get to because, well, the lack of dramatic persona and the names are a lot, quite quite a lot of names, especially if you're new to fantasy. But I think once you pass through the first half, I think yeah. I think the rest of the series should be a breeze to go through. For sure. Like if you're going yeah. from not reading fantasy directly to epic fantasy, yeah. it's probably the easiest to get into. If you just want something way more simple than something like Mistborn or something other like that. But but yeah, it's and also the magic system in this isn't like a there's not it's not complicated. It's just yeah. kind of like you're in a fantasy world, like there will be magical things. There's not like yeah. a there's system no that you magic. have to remember. Yeah, there's almost no magic, I think. In it's awesome. Awesome. Almost yeah. done. Yeah. Are we ready? Are we ready? Yes, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I've got all that non-spoilery <laughs> thoughts out. So excited. I okay. hope everyone else wanted so, For anyone to... that hasn't read Ruin, please go away and read it and come back. And okay. we will get into spoilers now, just so that Alan can uh, control guys. himself. He's I hope anyone back. else wanted to talk for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just give one and then we'll take turns. I got I to talk about this one. I got to talk about this one part. We good? Can we talk about some mm -hmm. Let, let's, let's go. go. Yep. Scratch the edge. When, when freaking Veritas kicks over the thing with the <laughs> effigies, when those effigies got burned, y'all don't understand. I was like, yes! Yes! <laughs> Guys, I, lit, I audibly screamed. I was like, get him, Veritas. Get him. I was so happy when those... Freaking effigies were gone. I hate those stupid things. I hate them so much. Like yeah. when Veritas, like I knew that there was going to be um, uh, con uh, convergence at the castle when he was bringing uh, Maquin and Fidele. Uh, when he was bringing everybody to see it there, I knew we were going to get a convergence. So I knew something was going to happen. And just watching Veritas, like the horror as if, like, as when he's just like, what is going, like, what? What mm -hmm. is going on? Like, like, who are you? And, you know, Nathair, Nathair toes the line of the greater good, the great, like, yeah. I really like how Nathair has deluded himself and is leaning into this. And I think it was just really, I think Nathair realizes he doesn't have any choice. He can do this or he can be dead or be irrelevant. I think, I, like, I don't think Nathair just, I, I mean, I think he just was cornered by, I mean, he's a, I don't know. I just felt, I almost felt bad for Nathair. He's in he's too deep at this point. Yeah, what? he's too far gone. He's in too yeah. deep. He, yeah. he has no other choice, really, at yeah. this point. Otherwise, it's like, okay, well, you're of no use to me. So, yeah. 
and but now how alone he is like he's so alone because yeah. veritas is gone because veritas is like no like what and then when his freaking brother ector is like yes i am a servant of calidus i'm like what, <laughs> like that, oh, what? So you have so you had like veritas thinking that he killed his father which was like mind blown i was like oh no what's happened here he's killed his father too and then to find out that it was his brother Ector that killed him, and that, uh, and he had the realization that Nefer was not good. So then yeah. the uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. It was like everything happening back to back. Oh, yeah. When he when he lets when he frees uh, Fidele and, and Maquin, and at the end of that chapter is like, I'm gonna kill Calidus. I'm like, you're not. But I really <laughs> like you got to cut their heads off, Veritas. What are you doing? But pushing the when the effigies burn, guys. <laughs> oh my gosh like it was my my favorite part of the book i was so i hate those stupid things and when alcyon resisted when alcyon resisted the the yeah. magic like to not kill veritas good stuff you know alan i it sounds like one of those effigies in there was was one of you <laughs> <laughs> so happy that i'm free i'm free from calidus control <laughs> Oh my gosh, I, I'm so, I hate that magic. Like it's, I hate it. I'm just, yeah. ugh. I would say that uh, in terms of choices, you have, I, I would compare Veritas and the fair. And this was a moment, by the way, Alan, when I absolutely loved uh, Veritas. I, I was, I wouldn't say I was lukewarm, I liked him. Um, my favorite character was not Veritas previously, but boy, did he absolutely jump in my esteem as a result yeah. of that episode. But he has a similar choice to make, I would say that the fair has in that, okay, he's presented with this truth that what he thought was going on isn't what was going on. And in contrast to Nathair, Veritas makes the moral decision. He makes the selfless mm -hmm. decision. He makes the honorable decision. <laughs> truth and courage, man. So, <laughs> you know, I, I just think that we can't let Nathair off the hook. Yes, he's put in a terrible situation. Oh, of course not. Yes. Yeah. He's a terrible he, person. He's he is, terrible. He is, uh, uh, obviously, he's been cornered. But even when you're cornered, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. And yep. he could have chosen to die honorably, for example. I'm not saying that would have been an easy thing to do. <laughs> But yeah. it, humans are fundamentally selfish. Uh, so what That's he what's... does is understandable, but it's sure. still in contrast to Veritas, who does the right thing. I, and I so we're rooting feel, for him. I do feel as though if Nefer had said no, then Cowardice would have created an effigy for him because he needed him as like yeah, a yeah, he did say figure. That. Yeah. He won't go along. Yeah. yeah, but he still would have done the honorable thing. I think we would have, it would have been a different story a different arc if he had made that decision yeah. instead of yeah okay uh, i still want to be emperor you know even, even <laughs> yeah. I'm a puppet. that's what's so good about those two characters of nether and veritas from oh, book okay. one till now is just seeing sort of veritas being so loyal to nether and then finally yeah. getting to that point where he's just like okay like this how are wrong. you not seeing this we need to yeah. not be doing this and Nathair's just like no like i need to be you know, I'm the bright star. This is what has to happen at, you know, by any means necessary. And it's just like, yeah, but you're kind of going a little <laughs> mustache trolley villain here. You need to stop. Well, Veritas tries to give him the benefit of the doubt, even after all this crap. Yeah. But it's like, it's when he condemns Maquin and Fidele in favor of Lycos, yep. knowing every, like he literally <laughs> hears everything that Lycos has done. And he's still like, sorry, I got to go with Lycos. Veritas is like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, yeah. Do what? you have eyes and ears? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's what Veritas is like. This isn't for the greater good. This is bull crap. Like, this yeah. is bull. You're not making any of the right decisions. Yeah. And Gwen does a great job, by the way, of leading this character to this point. Because yeah. in the previous two books, there were definitely doubts. Veritas mm -hmm. had doubts all along. Even though he kept t telling himself, greater good, greater good. He had mm -hmm. it was getting harder and harder, I think, for him to convince himself. So I like the arc here. It's it's really nicely done. I mean, I you did want him to realize it sooner. You did sort of want to shake yeah. Veritas and be like, come on, realize what's going on in front of you. But I am um, I also like how I I I that well I'll let someone else talk for a second, but I have, I have something else to say when we're done. So, I was gonna Alan, say that's that's one of the good go ahead. 
No, no, Alex, you go ahead. I was just going to say that's one of the good things that I like about the series, sort of a non-spoiler thing too, is just normally a quartet would feel dragged out, whereas like the middle two books are kind of like yeah. stretched too thin, but he does such a good job of building up the characters in this book while yeah. keeping the plot moving that it like this, I'm glad this wasn't a trilogy because this actually was like four really fleshed out, well done books. Yeah. And I just appreciated the setup that he, or the, the structure of how he organized this book. That's a great point. Uh, I, I think he, the arcs are, are just fantastic here. And you're right, this, this needed to be four books. So yeah, yeah. Um, we, get, we get a lot of justice in this book. Like the hit list, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of bads get cleared from the field in this one. We lose what? We lose Braith. We lose, um, yeah. we lose uh, Evelyn, like we lose Evnis. Evnis, Evnis, sorry, Evnis. Yeah. We, lose, we lose a lot of the, um, I was combining Ev Evnis and Camlin. Uh, <laughs> we lose a lot of the bads, but my two top are still on the playing field. <laughs> Niall and Lycos. Lycos are still there. <laughs> like, hi, Alan. You had a moment there where Mackin does some serious damage to Lycos, and I thought that yeah. would be one of your favorite moments. Yeah. When he, oh, when, when Lycos does the, and Macquig just like, and I credit as a writer because it felt explosive. From the page, you can feel Macquig exploding over the table to get to Lycos. And it's not easy to write explosive yeah. action. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. Like, yeah. It's, like action is one thing, but like where it feels like it's exploding off the page, like I like kind of did this with like how fast Macquin jumped across that table. Get him. <laughs> Lycos was mostly sidelined in this book. There wasn't a ton of Lycos in this book. There was a little bit, but not a ton. But Macquin bites part of his face off and-, and I know, yeah. suck it, Lycos. That's the malight. Alan, I was actually thinking about you during that scene. I thought, okay, Alan's gonna love this. So. I was very pleased. I was very pleased. And that, I liked that until Veritas burns the effigies and then like all, I just completely forgot it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh, But I like that a lot of the, like a lot of people died in this book, like a freaking yeah. lot. I, I think I'm still recovering from Tuchel dying. <laughs> Yeah, that was and the battle at Graham's Hole. Yeah, like, the battle that at Graham's Hole was crazy. <laughs> that was definitely the biggest like impact for a while in this book. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, like I mean, you, you, I kind of saw the Tuchel thing coming. Like I think it, it's pretty telegraphed, but like still, like oh man, come on. Yeah, come yeah. On, yeah. It's one of those where like you see it coming, but it still hurts, which oh, just tells you how how well done it was. And he's so brutal. <laughs> that one so boring. Tuchel's yeah. a dad, so he had to die, right? Like all the dads. Of course. <laughs> Their parents must be must die. Evnis died too. Trying to shank his son. <laughs> I'm so happy when Evnis died. I was like, oh, yes. Evnis Especially that Evnis. he didn't get Vaughn. Like, the, it happened. Were, were you guys surprised by the Vaughn arc? That um, I, I thought we were, we were leading to Vaughn kind of going back to his dad at some point, and I that didn't, didn't happen feel that way. And I'm glad I'm glad it didn't happen that way because I was kind of like liking Vaughn. I think Vaughn wants to be a good man, and he sees that his that his dad is not a good man. Like yeah. his dad is responsible for the death of so many of his friends. You know, I don't know. I think Vaughn. I think Vaughn is honorable or wants to be, but you know, people are like, "Well, you're the Evnis's boy." Right. I, I I actually didn't predict that uh, Ethnis would die in this book because uh, I, I thought he either. would make it to the end. <laughs> he, Since he was we there in making the pact with with Zath or whatever, not a Zath, uh, Azroth. Azroth, yeah, <laughs> Zath. Yeah. <laughs> guys, so, uh, what's the next scene we should talk about? Guys, <clears throat> guys, I wept. When when everyone is swearing their allegiance to Corbin, yeah, yeah. And guys, yeah. I don't usually cry at dying scenes, so it's usually like the the really like overwhelming like triumphant. loyalty moments and triumphant yeah. moments that just like like I'm, I'm I, oh man, I'm, it's gonna happen now. I don't <laughs> know. It was there was something so special about this kid who was asking like who doesn't want to ask anything from these people like. He cares about these people. He doesn't want them to die for him. That's yeah. one of the things I really loved about this book was Corbin dealing with leadership, Corbin accepting and 
you know, accepting the fact that people are going to die because he said so. <laughs> and they still say, you know what? You're our guy, Corbin. And like, I've got chills. Just everyone swearing their thing. Like it just brought me, it brought me to tears. It was so well written and I could hear the music swell. <laughs> I could, like guys, I love inspirational sports movies. They're one, I know like I don't yeah. play sports and it's super shocking, but inspirational sports movies are some of my favorite movies because of that, like that, you know, speech that always gets given where the, where yeah. the music swells and everybody's like, yeah, let's go get them, man. It was, oh, it was too much for me. I remember so reading good. that scene and thinking, Alan's going to like this. <laughs> because of the, like, the inspirational like soundtrack that yeah. I had in my head going along with it. So good. It was so good. And, and one then, thing what, that makes What it... about the battle with, the Corbin battle with Suma? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, the one-on-one. -on -one? That, yeah. one, that one-on-one -on -one battle. That was so good. It was so epic. And then at the end where uh, Jail's like, you know what? We're going after them anyway, even though we said we weren't. And there was the, what was it called? The running leap onto the horse. Yeah. I was like, yes, cool. That was awesome. But who was... didn't think Jael was going to, was going to like break the rules? Of course. Of course he, was of course he is. Of course he was, because he's Jael. He's and the he's worst. A... Jael. <laughs> I hate him. <laughs> Like, if Jael does not die in wrath, I am sending an angrily worded letter to John Gwynn. And it's going to go, it's going to be in, it's going to go by post. I'm going to send it by Pony Express. <laughs> guy's going to show up at his house, knock, knock, knock. It's going to, it's going to hand it to him and it's going to read it out to him. Alan is displeased. <laughs> One of the great things about that um, allegiance scene when everybody's swearing to Corbin is how, it works on a couple of levels and I think it's really well done. There's some very personal relationships involved in that swearing. You have, uh, it's interesting because Corbin's sister, you know, Cohen or Cywin mm -hmm. is, is among the followers and he has, and, and Gar and all these other characters that we love. And it's those personal relationships with Corbin, I think that gives that scene such power. Plus you have the bigger picture of everybody there and the whole, and you know, everybody cheers and it's, it's a really powerful thing. It's a lot of those powerful scenes in there, but I think maybe one of the most powerful emotionally is the scene that Patrick talked about, uh, which is the the three reasons I came back scene. Yeah, uh, oh, I thought gosh. that was just so <clears throat> neat and so well done and and okay. wonderful, uh, beautiful moment. And I, I love the development of of Mackin, but also the development of Fidele. I, I think she, I, I love where Gwen has taken her character. She's she's become kind of a favorite for me too. Another romance I liked too, Abby. I love yeah. the romance. Three romances in this book, in this series, I like. I love their romance. It's so cute and endearing. Oh. And McKean yeah. and, and Fidele is is great. Yeah, it's great. Like, just, like, I was just like just seeing them together, and like when that scene where he was like, "I came back for." you with the love and you're like oh, yeah oh. <laughs> so good. oh it's so good and i like that they're like they're like grown adults like mac is not a young guy he's an old guy oh. yeah he's yeah like, like past middle age or reaching the past middle age and it's so not like, like two 17 year olds yeah exactly so i like you just don't see adult like really like adult romance a lot I, at least i don't in the books that i read it's usually like younger people like even yeah. if it's not teenagers like 20 year olds or something yeah so he's, I, he's 42 i think it doesn't it say somewhere in there yeah, oh, there no, no, yeah. a good amount of this cast are like older, older. adults yeah. which is refreshing it's not you know a song of ice and fire where they're all like really young or even most things where they're you know 22 23 yeah and a, and a lot of them be choosing to be led by corbin who is at this point yeah, was he nineteen now, seventeen, something like that. Seventeen, seventeen. Um, yeah, it's just like Corbin learning to Corbin learning to lead is just really like he, Gwyn writes Corbin so well. Like I'm never annoyed at Corbin, even when he's like, "No, I don't want to." Yeah, I'm like I get it, man. Like I get it. I know why you don't want to. I understand. Well, that makes yeah, even more sense after that. Ruin, right? Because because yeah. of the prophecy. Oh, oh God, that prophecy twist. I guess we didn't talk about that. <laughs> you know yeah, what, Michael? We'll Screw you, Michael. Screw <laughs> you and the horse you rode in on. Well, he did get kind of screwed there at the end now, didn't he? I mean, yeah, he, uh, he, did. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't need it. I was not expecting Michael to, first of all, just confess, uh, yeah, I made up the whole thing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then immediately be like, but you still need to do this for us. You don't I know we completely morale. ruined your life. <laughs> you don't torch morale. You don't, like, what are you doing, 
Michael. Tell him after you've won. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the thing it's, is, it's the twist on it, it's like how it, it, Michael's like, okay, the prophecy's not real. I made it all up. But it sort of has become real because it, of all yeah. the circumstances where you're like, oh, that can't just, that's not, that's prophet, prophetic in what it's been. Because like the, yeah, the guard, I mean, uh, the bright sun, oh, the bright star, the dark sun. It sort of became a real prophecy, even if it wasn't meant. Yeah, to be I mean, they the they fabricated it, but then it's like what they did to the world. It's like now you basically have to see it through, even though you made it up. Like, yeah. what other choice do you have? And that's why I think that scene with Corbin and everybody swearing loyalty to him is even more powerful, yeah. because you know people are starting to understand that there is no bright star, or, you know, black sun, and you still kind of have to fight this fight this war. Yeah, there's a placebo effect here where, <laughs> you know, where, where mm -hmm. Corbin sort of slowly starts accepting, okay, I guess this is my role and everybody's behind. So he becomes, I guess, in a way, but I like that Gwyn takes this trope here and does something really different with it. Uh, Michael, you, you have a totally different view of him at the end of Ruin than you did before. Yeah. And I like the <laughs> idea that there are actually no real prophecies that you make of your life, you know, what you do. And it's not some something written in the stars somewhere else. I think that gives some agency. Alan, you were talking about agency before. This gives, in a way, uh, Corbin doesn't see it yet. I expect he will in Wrath, but it gives him agency in a way for him to know, okay, I, <laughs> there is no prophecy. I'm not the, the chosen one, uh, but I guess I could still go through with this struggle, you know? And, and that's that's a really cool thing. It must be a hard place to be in. Like you've been told for the past couple of years or whatever, that you're the chosen one. You're yeah. the, the one that everyone's been waiting for that's in this prophecy. And then yeah. so you've, got, you, you've got your head around that because he really struggled with that in the beginning. He didn't want to be the chosen one. And then to be told now that <laughs> actually it's all just made up. He's a fake chosen one. And, and so he's got to wrap his head around that again whilst also yeah, having the yeah. fact that all these people are now relying on him and think that he is the chosen one. Well, I think that's part yeah. of Nathair's problem is he was like years, spent years believing that he was the chosen one too. And yeah. I think Nathair's too proud. Yeah, he's brainwashed essentially. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I also think he's too arrogant. I think, <clears throat> I think he, he has oh, yeah. too high of an opinion of himself to do the right thing yep. because then he can't be the great man. Like, I think he's just like, I'm going to be a great man I guess this is the only path to that now. I, I would have preferred to be the great man the other direction, but guess I'm gonna be a bad guy. Like, you know. Yeah. But the alternative is to, is to die and no one give a crap. And I don't think that they can accept that. I think he's too arrogant. Yeah. yeah. And the, the scene when he uh, sees his mother finally after all that time, that oh, feels yeah. like the, the biggest betrayal. <laughs> Oh. on Nathair's mm. part, yep. how he dismisses yeah. what he's saying to him. And he's doing it purely out of self-interest because it's inconvenient for him. Because he definitely knows. He you know? definitely knows she's he telling knows. the truth. He knows what life yeah. is, <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's just a, that scene is painful and really well done, but it tells you how far Nathair has gone. And yeah. That's yep. one thing. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Patrick. No, no. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to say that there is no re redemption for him at that point. <laughs> no. No. But that's that. And that leads to, I love what John Gwynn has done with Calidus and the, like the, the, the Christian inf uh, uh, mythos influence. Calidus yeah. is safe. Like he is oh, yeah. the prince of 100%. lies. Calidus isn't like that. The, the whole point is that the devil is the prince of lies. He tells you enough truth to where you can buy it and you can sell it to yourself and you can sell it to other people. The whole thing about like, is Azroth the bad guy? Like, is Azroth really the bad guy? Like, like, aren't they just two different, like, aren't they just the same with two different ideals of how like, like just the way he sells everything where you're kind of like, I mean, I get that. You're a horribly evil human being, but he just like coats it in just this, it's just lie upon lie upon lie. The way Calidus talks 
is so brilliant. He's just a master manipulator, giving them yeah. just a tiny bit of doubt to where they yeah. can hang themselves with it. Like he, he feeds yeah. them out a little bit of rope so they can make their own gallows. Plant that tiny little seed of doubt where they're like, well, that's, and that's all it takes. It's just, ah, man, Calidus makes me, he makes my skin crawl. <laughs> what do you think of the Kadoshim and seeing them for the first time? Because this is the first time we actually saw them, or like more of them. Freaking Kadoshim, they're overpowered. Like, I hate them. They're overpowered. <laughs> like, they're OP. Just cut their heads so off. The devs, the devs need to nerf them because they, are, they have way too much. They're, they're too strong. Except that when Corbin beat Sumer, that was awesome. That was so awesome. So awesome. Oh, At least awesome. they don't have any grappling hooks, Alan. <laughs> Lycos used his grappling hooks again in this one to get in the freaking tower. Except that <clears throat> we find out that Hector, like it was Hector that let him up there, right? I think yeah. so. Yeah. Stupid grappling hooks. Um, <laughs> okay, so one thing that spoke to me personally, um, and this is about, are you leaving? I'm going to, oh, my wife's going to the farmer's market. Um, so uh, uh, Highland, Christina. okay, the little character Highland, the little, the little wannabe <laughs> king, right? Uh. Yeah, I, I, I kind of liked his development from like, I'm going to be the king to, you know what, I'm with this guy. And it spoke <laughs> to me, there's one particular line that, that made me, I got emotional because Highland's talking about why he follows Corbin. He follows Corbin because he says, he says, what is it? I wrote it down. He says, Corbin makes him feel like himself. He doesn't have to pretend to be anything else. He can just be who he wants to be. Like there's no pressure to be anybody else around Corbin. And for someone with Asperger's, like when you're on the spectrum, society, there's a great societal pressure for you to fall in and be what society wants you to be, to act, no, act normal in every situation. Yeah. And so for me, like, that's why like I, my wife is one of these wonderful people who just lets me be who I am, that my close friends are like that. It's just such a breath. It's so freeing to be around people who are just gonna let you be who you are. Like, mm -hmm. even if you're freaking weird or like there's no pressure for you to do this and that and, and this. And so I was just like, you know what? Like I would follow a guy like Corbin. If he makes you, if he makes you feel that way, that you can, you can freely be yourself without all this pressure. Cause Highland's a kid. He doesn't want all this pressure to freaking do all this. He only wants to be king cause his mom told him he needed to be. But now he's like, you know what? I can just go along. I can just be a kid. I can, I can hitch my wagon to this guy's star and I'm fine with that. And I just, I just loved that. I loved that little, that little evolution from this little brat to I'm going to make you serve me when I'm king to, you know, I love I, your, your nasally bad guy, like <laughs> Prince voice. That's what I'm talking about. Like. Every time there's a character being snotty, they just, they just talk like this. That's the snotty <laughs> I also love how Highland and Tahir, the relationship develops between those guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite parts of the whole book is when Highland quotes Tahir's mother back at Tahir. Do you remember that part? It made me laugh so much when um, he was, I can't remember exactly the, the nugget of wisdom, what it was, but it was something about going out and not, you know, facing your fears or something like that. And I remember that. He, he quotes Tahir's mom back at him in, in order to, to win his way with Tahir. And, it, and there's a little wink there and it's just a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like when he transitions from like, you're my servant to, you know what? Yeah. Like, we're kind of, you're, you're my buddy. Like, you're my friend. Yeah. Alan, did you know that in the next trilogy, that one of the main characters has Asperger's. I have, I have heard that, which is why I'm actually kind of really excited to read the, um, the what's the second trilogy called? Of Blood and Bone. Of Blood and Bone. Blood and Bone. Yeah, I'm. I'm oh, Time of Dread. Sorry. Because you don't see, you don't see spectrum representation a lot in books. You see it some in television. Um, so I read an in interview with John Gwynn, and it was saying that he was saying that he had based this character off of his son. Yeah, Will. Oh wow. That's awesome. That's I, I, super, I, I, that's great. It seems like it was really well done to me. That's, I'm, I'm super excited to read that. Yeah. Um, I think the only other character that I've read would be Renarin from Stormlight Archive. If, uh -huh. if and when you ever get to that, Alan. I'm excited to read Stormlight too. I still haven't read that. Renarin's um, awesome. Have we now? Have we discussed um, the end of Ruin? <laughs> we have not. Why don't you like us? Predictions. <laughs> Alan and I are the only ones who haven't read Wrath. So, Alan, here's the question that you asked before we started recording. Alan, is yeah. Storm dead? Oh, okay. So, I here's the thing. 
I would, we didn't see a body. We heard, we didn't see her die. We heard her last howl, but she didn't die on screen. She was wounded on screen. She didn't die on screen. And I would predict she is not dead, except she just had puppies. Without the puppies, I would predict her living. But the fact that we have surrogates, like we have replacements essentially, makes me like scared for her because then they, he can keep the wolven in and they can like, he can, you know, raise the wolven to be like, you know, they can ride them or whatever. Um, <laughs> like, like the stupid giants ride the stupid bears. Tuchel it's wrecking awesome. that dude on the bears. Shroom, shroom. <laughs> Get him, Tuchel. Wouldn't you um, see a giant riding a bear, Alan? Like, if they were fighting on the side of good, wouldn't you want to be a giant on a bear? Right? Oh, 100%. Like, 100%. <laughs> yes. Are you kidding? Um, I think that was one of the Goodreads updates that I made while I was reading Ruin. I was like, there are literally giants riding bears into battle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if Storm is dead. I mean, that's really sad if she is because I really like Storm and I don't like Animal Companions. In fact, I read a book recently that had Animal Companion that I did not like at all. And it ruined my overall enjoyment of the book. It made me very sad. Um, <laughs> But I love Storm, and I hope she's not dead. But at the same time, I'm not really sure how anybody's going to get out of anything because they won. The bad guys won. Like, they were... Okay, that's the question I had. I'm confused. The half-breed, you know, the girl, the the little giantess half-breed? Yeah. Uh, I thought she was a good guy. She comes and gets Highland and saves him from his hidey hole when Graham's keep is being attacked. Right. So why then did she betray them twice? Like because she leads them to Drassel. My theory, Alan, is, <laughs> and I haven't read Wrath, so this is just theory, conflict. is that she is being a double agent, that she isn't really betraying them. Uh, I don't know. Except that I mean, everyone died. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. Uh, yeah, I was confused too, Philip. They were going to find that finally. anyway. They were, they were going to get to Drassel no matter what. So I don't know that she was the one that led them there. That's not even clear either. Um, she does offer her services uh, yeah. at that one moment, but you're right. I mean, she goes from saving Highland to mm. suddenly, oh, well, I can lead you. It just seems like, wait, I missed something there. Or she is deliberately, um, in a way, sacrificing herself because she yeah. knows that the others view her as a betrayer now. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens there. Yeah, I was just very question. confused. And <laughs> it's a bit of an also, Empire Strikes Back ending here, though, isn't it? Yeah. So I don't know how anybody's gonna. I don't know how anybody's gonna escape. Corbin's captured. Drassel's fall, fallen. Like, we think Jail ran away, injured. I, it's too much to hope that he died. Um, <laughs> well, that wouldn't be satisfying. So you know that's not that's true. That's true. I need if to they just find Jail dead somewhere, be like, oh, there he is. I, I have need a prediction. Back when crotch kick him, and that's the only way. I'll <laughs> I think Corlin is going to play a crucial role early in Wrath in terms of um, freeing Corbin, but I don't she, know for sure. Is she free? Where's Corlin? I don't she... know. That's why I think she's. I. I it's. It's not clear. I. I'm, I know that Cohen and the others have been captured at the end. Well, it's also, I think, going to be Veritas and Alcyon, because the last we see is Alcyon pulling Veritas out of the window. We don't see yes. them for, again for the rest of the book. So yes. they're yeah, they're in the river. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, I cannot, oh, I cannot wait for some Veritas moments. Oh. oh, oh. And the reuniting of Alcyon with his wife and child. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, did y'all, did y'all see it? Um, did y'all see it coming that the, the two giants were Alcyon's husband or wife and child? first find them at the, at the um, when they're first led to the boat camp or whatever it is. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I saw it coming when I read it, but I guess it makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I saw, saw it coming because like you knew that Calidus had something on Alcyon. And yeah, so sort of but I thought he had an like, effigy. What's it going to be? It's obviously going to be his family. Yeah. yeah. We uh, have not talked at all about the swamp characters the swamp oh, yeah. Hamlin and oh, yeah. <laughs> Donna and all of them like we've missed an entire oh, yeah. crucial <laughs> the other moment. half of the book <laughs> oh yeah and, and Rafe drinking from the cup at the end and the Rafe is a garbage human <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, now, he's now gonna live he forever his love for his his dogs I don't oh, he listen does love like the way Corbin he, 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 and Storm pet. Corbin yeah. and Storm animal companion 
from me. Rafe and his dogs kill all of them. <laughs> Who cares? They all just <laughs> just go away. I'm with you. I actually missed that he found. I forgot at the end when they're like, "Yeah," and Rafe drank from the cup. I said, "I said, I, where did he get yeah. that?" That reminded me. It's the when he dove cup. in the mud to save the dog. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's yeah. gonna be weird. Rafe's gonna live forever. This book tried to make me feel bad for Rafe, like, and his dogs being in danger. I was like, don't do that. That's not fair. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Family this- break. We got to talk about that a little more, don't we? I mean, that was a pretty, I felt um, some measure of satisfaction that, that Camlin <laughs> came out on top. Yes. Love Camlin. Like, Camlin's Camlin, so good, Camlin. He's an all star in this book. Like, he keeps freaking Adana and Co alive. Yeah. Yeah. And I love Meg. Like, oh yeah, she keeps, keeps Camlin alive. Keeps, yeah. Oh yeah, Mac. Yeah. <laughs> Little so when Camlin's girl. like, leave me alone. Like, just, just go, stay safe. Go, be over there. And she's like, no, 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 no. I'm coming with you. Oh yeah, <laughs> Morkent, Morkent has been added to my freaking uh, prescription list. Like, he's still alive, isn't he? Isn't Morkent still around? I think Morkent's alive. I don't think he. I don't think he bit it. Mm. Like, because because Rin is still alive, and she's she. He's hanging out with Rin all the time. Yeah, he, he came back whining and, and all that. Yeah, um, so yeah. yeah, he's still alive, yeah. Like, ugh, the fact that like all of those towns are just being completely ravaged, like on the, yeah. the, the suspicion of them helping um, yeah. Adana in the swamp. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, you see the two kinds of rules that would happen here. I mean, you see the one side led by the literal devil is <laughs> just kind of raising everything in his path. But yeah. Um, Jumping back to Rafe, then what Alan and and Philip, since you haven't read Wrath, what do you think he's going to do in Wrath? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> okay, so I want to say he's going to survive because if you drank from the cup and then don't live forever, what was the point? Like, what was the point? Unless he's turned into a demon somehow. Um, yeah. I I mean I th- I think Rafe is too far gone on the other side. I mean, well, I mean. Rafe doesn't really have anybody to serve anymore. Like Braith is gone. That was his boy. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess he's with Ran and Morkent. I don't really know. And the, the problem is, is I, I just don't care. Like, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that Rafe has some redeemable qualities. I'm actually more with Abby there. I, I, I felt like, okay, this is, uh, consider where he comes from. Remember his father. His father was not a good person. This was his, yeah. his role model. And I don't think there was a mother in the picture. I think the mother had, had passed away. Um, but I'm not saying that I like Rafe. I'm just saying that he has his, his redeemable right. quality is the way that he treats his pets. Yes, I, I see some possibility for redemption in this character. I don't know if that's gonna happen or not, um, but I, I do think his arc suddenly got really complicated because of him drinking from the cup. So yeah, we'll see. I mean, he I might mean, be really in strong trouble too. because other people really want that cup. So um, we'll see. It is interesting though, right? Like within three books, uh, even though when we read uh, when we read the book, because uh, the time the the time gap within each book is like two years or a year, and we don't see them. Happening, yeah, something right? like that. Yeah, yeah, and. We just read, uh, we just read them like nonstop. But when we look back, uh, a lot of things has has happened to these characters, and none of them has started the same as they were in the beginning. Yeah, well, none of them is the same anymore. Yeah, yeah. I like, I mean, I like the fact that Adana finally makes a stand. She's like, I'm not gonna run anymore. Like, we're gonna stop yeah. this yeah. castle, and we're gonna do something. And they do. They set those boats on fire. Like, <laughs> you know, like Camlin and the and the, the oil bombs and blowing. I love, I love. Fire no, no. attacks on the water are some of my favorites. <laughs> you know, how, about, how about the Adana Roishan confrontation? Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Did you see <laughs> that coming? I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, in terms of Adana's development, I, I wasn't entirely, I mean, I didn't see Roishan's betrayal coming, but I guess she's that awful. I don't know. I mean, it didn't. I like pers- Roishan was just very, she only thought about herself. And what she did yeah. mm-hmm. on the situation and out of people and she wasn't really thinking about like the global picture she's just thinking no she's hyper concerned with her and her son's survival and that's right. it like her son is, is selfish people right so you have another parent child relationship here where the kid is better than the parent right? i love the kid yeah. who's like i must protect my future bride and the daughter's <laughs> like dude stop <laughs> 
<laughs> that kid's like, oh, we will not. We're not going to do that. Yeah, it's just like, she's just, uh, she's just, ins- I don't like people who swear oaths. And th- I don't like oath breakers. Like, I don't Break like them. oath breakers. She agreed, like she bound herself to Adana. And then she freaking is breaking that crap. Like, Jael, you agreed to <laughs> adhere to the trial by combat rules. And of course, everyone knew you're going to break it because you're a sniveling little twerp. Of course. Like, <laughs> ugh, what a jack weasel. I hate Jael. <laughs> Who do you hate more right now, Lycos or Jael? Jael, um, Lycos. Yeah. I, I hate, I think I hate Jael more because Jael is. Really? Jael is sniveling. Like, I, I think Lycos is more dangerous and more despicable, but I just hate, like, but that makes me appreciate Lycos as a villain. Jael isn't yeah. even good at anything. Like, Jael's a weasel. He's, I don't like weaselly kitten. <laughs> oh, oh, he has the most punchable face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, for me, Lycos is the worst because he is. The worst. And oh, from Lycos, what he did in in Valor, I'm. Lycos is absolutely just just despicable. But uh, he's not a worm. Like I can't uh, wait for you to read Breath. I'm That's so he's not yet done. He's not yet done. <laughs> I, I have so many good books to read in in April. I have to read Morning Star. I'm reading Wrath. Oh, nice. I'm reading uh, Well of Ascension and Hero of Ages from Mistborn. Like I have the so month of conclusions. Much. I know, I know. It's gonna be it's gonna be good stuff. Is there anything else for the good of the order in in ruin? This was a good book, guys. Good book. Yeah, very good book. It's I, amazing. I did the quickest. Well, I wouldn't really call it a reread. I just flipped through yesterday, like flipped through all the chapters to make sure that I didn't accidentally because I read this and Wrath back to back. I didn't want to accidentally spoil anything from Wrath. Yeah, yeah. So I I flipped through it and I was just going, oh, I remember that scene. Oh, and that scene. Oh, and that scene. This all happened in this book. I like. Yeah. I like that Camlin has finally like accepted his role as like I'm living. He's living for more. You know, he's like like mm-hmm. I can swear my allegiance to these people and call them my friends. You know what I mean? Like he's like Camlin is is the queen's man through and through now. So and I, I was sort of saying when I was reading this, like some like the relationship between Camlin and Adana. Like part of me wanted something a little bit more to happen between the two of them. Or, you ship them? <laughs> or was that just, I mean, I didn't think that was just me. I, I would ship them also. What I need Cameron to do is put a, is put a uh, an arrow into Roisin and then dump, just push her off into the swamp and let her sink. Because <laughs> uh, she's just more trouble than she's worth. Get out. Get out. Who else you is not, there? You do not ship them then, Patrick. Uh... I would say that I don't mind that uh, if something happened within them, I would be fine with it. But if not, I'm okay too. <laughs> so who's your favorite character now, by the way, to all of you? Favorite character? Varys. Still, I'll go Sorry, it was, it was McKean for me in this book. Yeah, same here. Mac, Mackin for me. Mackin for me. Yeah. Ma- Maquin has been second since the last <clears throat> book. But my favorite's always been Veritas, even yeah. even even through his dumb crap. And in Ruin, <laughs> proved it to me. He proved it to me. I love Veritas. I Veritas love jumped so up. Much. Uh, Veritas like shot up the tier ranking for me after this book. Yeah. So did Corbin, because uh, for the first couple of books, Corbin's kind of you know young, reluctant, chosen one. He's probably one of the least interesting of the entire cast, and I really liked Cohen or Kywin, however we want to pronounce it, and Corlin. Um, and I really loved Gar, but like Corbin shot up in this book. Verity shot up in this book. All the villains are all despicable and all need to just be obliterated. Um, <laughs> but they're so they're so well done. And yeah, um, I'm still trying to decide my favorite character. I feel like I keep going between Corbin, Maquin, and um, Veridus. I'm like, who, wait, yeah. who is it? I like you all. Well, you guys have... You guys Both have seconds for me are Fidele and uh, Camlin. I, I like yeah, them. for sure. I really like Camlin as well. Like Camlin and Maquin, I think are vying for my second favorite. Like I just really love all the characters. Yeah, they're, they're so absolutely. good. They're so I even like the romance between Corlin and Corbin. That's the fourth romance in this book I like. Alan, I think this is a sign that you actually like romance. <laughs> I think yeah. I like John Gwynn's romances. <laughs> if they're well done and actually like make sense in the story. 
I think yeah, I like that he, he builds he builds them up to them. You know, they're not yeah. Yeah. a lot of times in fantasy. There's no instant love. Yeah, in fantasy, too often you just see instant boom. You know, and I like how Gwyn has led us to this point, and and he yeah. does it patiently. That's something that that takes a lot of skill as an author. So that, I appreciate. I feel this though. We got the build up of the characters like separately, like all the characters just built up gradually as we saw their development, and then there was yeah. like the slowly, slowly built together into the relationships. Yeah, for sure. Like it would have been really easy for Valor, for Corbin and Corlin to meet and then just like immediately love each other. But mm -hmm. he didn't do that, which he's continued to build from there and almost where they were like standoffish towards each other to kind of growing to actually appreciate each other and growing from there is is awesome to see. Yeah, I think I think all, all the character development is really organic. Like, yeah, it is. Yeah, like I'm, I keep sitting here, I'm a Nathair apologist apparently. <laughs> I feel no, bad. he's gone. No, he's, he's too the far worst. Off. No, he's awful. But I just feel bad for how he got there. Yeah. And sure. so, like, John Glenn just does a really good job, like, just pacing, pacing those developments over yeah. these over these three books where you don't have to shove everything into one book. So good. Yeah, none of it feels rushed. And I think it's it takes skill to to make empathetic villains where you can still feel oh. bad for them, but also realize like, okay, they still need to go. Like, I feel bad for you, but you need yeah. a sword through your head. <laughs> yeah. Although so, yeah. Alan does not feel bad for Jael. He doesn't even try to make you feel bad for Jael. Jael's no. the, people like Jael and Lycos aren't, they're not the, the sympathetic villains. Those three and Calidus, no, no, no. We're just supposed to hate them. And that's fine yeah. because I yeah. do. <laughs> like if, if these books don't end with them strung up by their ankles and treated like a pinata, I'm gonna be super <laughs> upset. Like, like it. Like if John Gwynn is is really joining us for wrath, like I'm gonna have questions if these people. Are Gael not is the hero of the story, Alan. He's not the hero. <laughs> First, I hate him so much. I hate Gael. Like I'm not sure I've despised a character more than Gael. He's just everything I hate about just like. Just he's freaking entitled, highborn, like just arrogant. Wheezy, arrogant, doesn't take responsibility, cowardly. doesn't actually get yeah, cowardly. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like is in the right place at the right time, but runs at the first sign of danger, acts tough until like <laughs> you know he cuts his thing and he's like, oh mommy, oh. <laughs> like Prince John from the Robin Hood movie. <laughs> how well written he is that we have such strong emotions towards the evil characters that you I mean I hope he gets written out like he needs to be, <laughs> yeah, he's written like I, I would be fine if the last chapter was Maquin murdering Jael instead of <laughs> any Corbin like just end it there John Gwen <laughs> epilogue Maquin kills Jael <laughs> I've got to read Wrath I've got to know right. I cannot wait for you to read Wrath any other thoughts anyone needs to get out have you Alan, are you feeling like you've got all of your spoilery thoughts out now? Anything it's else? So good. It's such a good book. Such a good book. So many. Anything good else that's itching to be spoken books. about, or are we calling it there? Is there anything else? I think I think there is any, something else, but I cannot remember right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there. there's more. There's, there's always, always more. something else. There's always. Yeah. Something else. <laughs> okay. But I think we did a pretty good job. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah well, as soon as we end the call, we'll think of something. Be like yeah. ah crap. Yeah, that, we'll that usually happens. And say <laughs> that we will, you'll see us all next month where we will be on Petrick's channel to discuss yeah. Wrath, which Rad. we are all very much looking forward to. So, so good. Oh, we're almost at the end. to uh, discuss that book <laughs> with you all. Yeah, well, yeah. And uh, looking forward to that. So uh, thank you all for watching and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.